All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, can everybody hear me okay? The uh, uh, exciting thing for me to see is how far the systematic approach to craniofacial development has come in quite a few of the talks today. I'm going to take a slightly different approach and talk about the translational aspects of what we're doing, uh, focusing on human craniofacial dysmorphoses and our efforts at uh, rapid gene discovery. So far, it hasn't been too rapid, uh, but uh, we're rapidly picking up speed, and I hope to excite you with uh, what the prospects are uh, for what's to come. So um, the, uh, I don't think I have to tell anybody in this room that sequencing is transformative for biomedicine. It's, uh, the cost is plummeting uh, steadily. Uh, uh, research exome is $400, so this brings all kinds of sequencing projects into uh, the realm of possible. Uh, only a small fraction of the genes have assigned human phenotypes, so we're really interested in the functional annotation of the human genome. The real, uh, another aspect is monogenic disease genes can contribute to common disease phenotypes. That's exemplified by IRF6 and cleft palate. And one of the most exciting things, though, is the fact that it really represents an integration of uh, clinical medicine with research. These are real patients that we're studying, but the, uh, the work goes into the laboratory at a functional level. So the raison d'etre of our project is really to apply whole exome or increasingly whole genome to carefully selected cases, of monogenic diseases, uh, and to look for genetic etiologies and potentially the insight that would provide for therapy. So um, the idea is really very simple. We've shown this slide before. The idea is to identify really important cases, and we'll talk about how those can be identified. Uh, high throughput whole exome, in some cases followed by whole genome if exome is uh, not revealing. There is a computational component that is uh, focused on how we identify specific high probability causal variants. And then in one of the real hearts and souls of the project, the idea was to take this into model systems, specifically zebrafish, and to a lesser extent, mouse and biochemical approaches to prove causality. Uh, the other way to prove causality, of course, is to find independent cases of the disease phenotype that you're studying that have mutations in the same gene. So uh, this just says what I just told you. These are the three specific aims of our project, to identify and ascertain recruit patients with a wide range of cranial dysmorphoses of likely monogenic etiology, and that's important. Uh, to try to develop a high-throughput system for sequencing these and getting the uh, candidate variants, and then using expression and functional analysis to prove causality. So um, this is perhaps the only didactic slide I'll show, but I think it's a very important one. And so probably everyone in this room would recognize that this is a uh, disorder that has a genetic etiology because of the familial inheritance. But in craniofacial defects, as in most, most birth defects, we really much more commonly encounter different uh, paradigm, which is that we find simplex cases where there's one affected individual in a family. And of course, how do you know that that's genetic? You don't actually know that, but there are two really important paradigms, de novo dominant mutations, in which the mutations in the germline, and recessive variants, in which these are extremely uh, attractable by bioinformatic approaches. So in the case of the de novo mutation, if you sequence the proband in the parents, they're unaffected. Their sequence uh, variants uh, will not contain the causal variant that's present only in the proband. So it's a simple um, subtraction, basically, algorithm. And there's usually, if the filters are set right, only a few of these candidates you know, talking about coding region non-synonymous variants. Recessive, there's usually a few more. But these are very powerful bioinformatic paradigms so that, in fact, if you have a single affected individual, it shouldn't be dismissed as being necessarily, though it may be polygenic, polygenic and environmental, or any other kind of complex etiology. Um, there's some fundamental assumptions. These are monogenic. There's complete penetrance, which is not always the case, and that makes the situation much more complex. And then, as I just said, we're limited this to protein coding mutations only, site mutations, and structural variants. In the future, we hope to have technology that will allow us to look in non-coding parts of the genome much more efficiently for using whole genome sequence, which is the destination technology. So this is really the secret sauce of the approach, which is the fact that we have an interdisciplinary team that meets now weekly 
Um, we started from the Clarity Challenge, which was a competition to find cases that we could solve knowing only the sequence from 2012. And the fact is that there's clinical bioinformatics and experimental expertise integrated in these meetings uh, with the idea of taking cases, deciding which ones are good for sequencing, and once the variant list comes back, what are the candidate variants that make the most sense to evaluate functionally? So far, we've ascertained 37 cases. We haven't accepted all of those, as I'll talk about in a minute. In our proposal, and I'll get to this, uh, we had proposed to actually find 25 new disease-causing, craniofacial disease-causing mutations in novel genes during the five years of the grant. Um, we'll have to tackle more cases to have that solution rate. Uh, we're going to expand these case referrals and develop statistical and computational approaches as we go. Okay, so um, the one other thing I'll just add is that we don't take every case that comes along. So first of all, we want to have cases that we actually have a chance to uh, learn something. We also want cases that we really think we can solve. So in the dominant case I showed you a minute ago, if you really only have a limited number of family members, you can't solve that case you will have too many variants to really make practical sense. And so we always try to get the number of variants to be considered to be less than 10, to have any realistic chance of sorting those down to a single variant. Um, what would be important biological considerations and do we have a follow-up strategy? And then it's an interdisciplinary approach uh, goes from there. So these are some genes that we got sort of a head start on. And uh, this is a little bit cheating because some of these were cases that we started on working before we began to work in uh, phase base two. Some were published earlier, but we've had some successes. Uh, one is a CAPZ-B gene that's involved in craniofacial development in uh, clefting. And then RSPRY, I'll show you that case in a minute. And uh, some others coming along, and I'll talk about a couple of these. Um, we've had a big assist from our uh, uh, collaborators, uh, and I'll talk about that. But before I do, I wanted to just go over the uh, milestone projections and show where we are. So in the original grant, we said we would try to solve 25 cases in the five years of the grant. And when you tackle this kind of work, you really can only expect to solve about a quarter of them. That's a statistic not from our own work, which is about the same as that, but from Baylor's, which has sequenced thousands of cases now. Um, there are probably a lot of mutations out there that are not going to be in coding regions. And so uh, this is about the best you can do. So that means you have to basically tackle 100 cases if you realistically want to solve 25. That's, of course, just an approximation. If we're going to, that means a case is accepted, not cases evaluated. Trio assumption, most of these are going to be trio sequencing, but not all. So it's about 250 to 300 individuals need to be consented and sequenced parents and affected probands in most cases. And then the modeling has to follow that to get 25 cases of uh, causality. So where are we? So, so far we've evaluated 37 cases. We've accepted 22. We have rejected four and we have 11 in limbo. They're in limbo because we're not sure we can get all the family members we need to solve the case for sequencing or the phenotype is ambiguous and needs more clarification to decide if it's really worth studying or there's some other uh, reason. And so the uh, cases consented so far the 10 we've had before, we have six more trios and two more uh, families or patients in which there's only one consented individual. DNA is drawn five uh, with five trios. Two have been, 10 were sequenced before, two have come back recently, and we've got nine models underway. So you can see that there's a dynamic rate limiting step to this workflow, at least for now, the rate limiting step is finding and getting interesting cases, but in the remaining time, I'm going to show you how we're going to address that or are addressing that. Then I, I suspect what is going to happen is that the rate limiting step will become getting the sequences back, which is currently about a month turnaround. We're doing those at the Broad Institute. And then after that, the analysis time will, will be the rate limiting step. And ultimately, when the project is at steady state, the rate limiting step will be right here proving causality for the small set of candidates that we'll have for each case. So that's the particular challenge of this, this project. All right, so some uh, interesting cases, uh, and I'll just give some examples, uh, not in depth. And I think the problem with this project is that it really sets a tension between depth and breadth. We'd like to find causal variants for these cases, 
but obviously we can't study any of them in depth under the context of this particular grant. And so uh, making peace with that has been, uh, been a bit of a, a struggle. But in any case, so at the risk of going through these, um, this is a case of cleft palate. These cases came from our collaborator at King Faisal uh, Research Institute and Specialist Hospital in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And Fauzan remains a collaborator on this grant, but we've not been able to actually work out a relationship in terms of funding it as a subcontract. So for now, he's finding cases, and if they're interesting, we will model them. But there's no exchange of funds that are going to go on with King Faisal uh, Institute. But what you'll notice, and the reason I mention that, is that these cases tend to be consanguineous pedigrees, which is rampant in uh, the Middle East, and that makes them very easy to solve from a genetic point of view. The other unique value of this collaboration has been these are very unusual cases, uh, things that we don't typically see in the clinic in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, for example. So in this case, there's cleft palate, there's a skeletal dysmorphism. There was a first cousin marriage here. So that, uh, in fact, this is a, these are all recessive. Uh, in this case, there's uh, microcephaly and secal facies, which refers to the beak-like nose and frontal uh, 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 prominence. Uh, here's a case of facial dysmorphosis in another consanguineous uh, pedigrees. Here's one in which there's hydrocephalus. This is an enlarged uh, uh, skull. And in fact, there's also a Hirschsprung disease in that. And I'll talk about these two cases in a minute. This one is a skeletal dysmorphosis, which we found the gene for, uh, a novel uh, uh, ring finger domain called RSPRY1, and that was published last year. So uh, these are cases from Falzon. Now, this is the one I've showed you at the beginning, which has the cleft palate, skull abnormalities, there's some heart and skin abnormalities. And this patient has a missense mutation in myosin binding protein C2. And so very quickly, we've, we think this is causal, but missense mutations are not always easy to evaluate, as you know. Uh, Eric Liao, who's been uh, done a yeoman's work on this in zebrafish, using CRISPR now in a fairly high-throughput way, is quickly able to make a zebrafish mutant. And you'll see here, this is the wild-type uh, sequence. This is, in fact, a series of indels reflecting the non-homologous end-joining activity of CRISPR in the F1 generation that was made. Fortunately, don't know yet, I think, what the phenotype is, because we have to cross these to about the F3 level to rid the uh, analysis of background effects. But what you can see is that there's expression, Eric tells me at least, that this expression right here is in the craniofacial musculature. And so that shows how expression data, plus the fact that there's a mutation in this gene, a likely mutation, uh, makes it very likely that this is the causal variant. And we hope to get proof for that from the zebrafish model. Now, if we can find another human case in the meantime, independent case, that would also be probative. The uh, next example is the one with the hydrocephalus. This is a candidate mutation in ISLR2, immunoglobulin superfamily leucine-rich 2. That's not so important. The, uh, what's interesting is the fact that this gene in the zebrafish is expected in the dor expressed in dorsal root ganglion and was shown in mammals to have a role in axonal uh, pathfinding. And so it's plausible to think that a disorder like Hirschsprung disease, which is a disorder of neural crest migration into the gut, uh, and perhaps the CNS phenotype as well, would reflect deficient activity in this particular gene. So this is also being modeled. There's already uh, a series of mutations in this gene, and that's also being crossed to uh, uh, get homozygous uh, fish. And these are candidate loss of function uh, mutations. All right. Now, excitingly for us, we've been able to make a uh, collaboration with Pedro Sanchez at uh, USC and at uh, uh, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Pedro has, uh, where he's director of craniofacial genetics, has a wealth of uh, really interesting cases. And so this is just a small selection of those. But we're excited. Pedro actually going to leave this meeting tomorrow and fly with Eric and I back to Boston to present his cases to our working group that I showed you the picture of earlier as a way to uh, vet these and decide which ones are the most attractive strategic targets for sequencing. So I'm only going to mention one or two of them quickly. This is a case of Treacher Collins syndrome in the proband but it's a case of identical twins. They both have TCOF1 mutations, but one of them is basically unaffected. 
And so you know that in treacher collins syndrome, one of the hallmarks of that disorder is the extraordinarily wide range of expressivity. And so we have the idea, because these are identical twins, that if we sequence both of them, we may find discordance at the locus that is responsible for modifying the treacher collins phenotype. So that's an exciting uh, opportunity, we think. This is an unusual syndrome that's never been described very well before, or at least there's no gene for it, acrofrontofacial nasal dysostosis. Uh, you'll see that there's actually no nasal bone, and this is actually pigmentation under the scalp. Um, these are some other unknowns here, and this is a particularly interesting case, in fact, of what seems to be dominant inheritance. This is the mother, and this is the child uh, with clefting, ectropion, imperforant anus, and other things that make it seem like it's a true dominant disorder. So we hope to be able to solve that. Um, and there's several others. So we're very excited about this. And I will mention that Ophir Klein has collected, he told me today, 20 cases of interesting craniofacial uh, anomalies. So we're going to take these on. We're a little worried that once the floodgates open, we'll have so many to worry about that the, uh, we'll be overwhelmed. But uh, that hasn't been the problem so far, I guess. Uh, Steve's laughing. So um, I'll tell you about a few cases that we've ascertained in Boston uh, from Joan Stuller and Catherine Nowak, who are clinical colleagues there. Um, this is a case of uh, uh, calvaro asymmetry, asymmetric skull configuration with some craniosynostosis and abnormalities of sutures. Um, there's very abnormality, uh, very severe abnormalities of the C-spine, vertebral fusions, um, and some other things, hearing loss, and so forth. So most of these cases are simple. There's no parental stigmata of craniofacial disorders. We don't know what we'll find, whether these are recessive or de novo dominant. It's quite possible they are complex or environmental. And so uh, we're eager to get going on these and see uh, what we find. Um, here's one. This is a case of Eric's. It's a particularly striking case. So it shows you we have cases that look not so uh, severely affected and others that are extremely uh, disabled. So this is a case of two sibs in an Amish family. We would suspect from this pedigree that this is a recessive inheritance model. Eric saw this patient here, BB, now six years old. This is the girl who had oblique facial clefting, sometimes called Tessier cleavage or clefting. This is, uh, uh, she has uh, non-functional globes. This is after repair, a tribute to Eric's uh, masterful surgical skills. This is the Younger brother, E.B., who just presented at the age of three months, has virtually the same uh, disorder, has no globes at all. So these are severe uh, oblique facial clefting uh, cases. And because of the recessive inheritance, they should be solvable. Um, here's a case that came to us from Turkey, and we get more international referrals now. This is actually another one of these consanguineous pedigrees, so we suspect recessive inheritance. Basically, cleft palate, microcephaly, and uh, uh, I think there was also gastric malrotation here. So uh, th these consanguineous cases are remarkably easy to solve. We don't actually even have to sequence a trio. You can sequence the proband, map the regions of homozygosity, and then take the variants that come out of those regions and do PCR segregation in the unaffected SIBs. And from that, you can often find the candidate gene. So actually one sequence per Pedigree in this case is sometimes sufficient. We've had several successes of that. Now, here's a case, uh, another one of Catherine's cases. This child has macrocephaly, large calvarian, and frontal bossing, and uh, some other issues, developmental delay that I believe is fairly severe, and some cardiac abnormalities. This was a case when we're actually, uh, as is often happening, we came, the child came with the sequence. Uh, not had not been interpreted, but had a list of uh, variants from gene DX. And so uh, our group was asked to look at that. And um, we found that, in fact, there was a variant of very striking significance, even though it was classified as a known significance because it's never been seen before. So there's a de novo mutation in this gene here, MAP kinase K3, uh, MAP kinase 3K7, uh, cysteine to tyrosine uh, mutation in this kinase domain, it's a, a serine threonine kinase. These are autophosphorylation sites. It maps very near one of these. Um, it's a highly conserved site, as I'll show you. There are no examples of this variant in the databases anywhere exact. 
And it uh, has another name besides MAP kinase 3K7, which is TGF beta activated kinase or TAC1. And TAC1 interacts with a, uh, another protein called TGF beta activated kinase uh, binding protein 1. So what was interesting was with this candidate variant, we looked in databases and found there are two other cases of variants that affect this gene. One in case has a similar phenotype. One has the opposite phenotype. The one with the opposite phenotype is actually, meaning microcephaly, is actually a deletion of the gene. The other case was classified as a Treacher Collins variant. So that's a splicing mutation. So we're not sure if this is causal, but um, one thing that makes us think it is is that it maps to this particularly interesting region in the kinase domain, shown in green here, which just happens to be the binding site for ATP, this is a kinase, and also for that uh, binding protein uh, one that uh, I told you about a minute ago. Um, on top of that, there's a series of kinase inhibitors that map to the same site. Uh, these type two kinase inhibitors map at the same residues, in fact, that is mutated from cysteine to uh, from uh, cysteine to tyrosine. So the hypothesis would be that this may be actually a gain of function variant. We don't know, but that's subject to biochemical test and also can be modeled. So that's underway. Now, here's a case, and then I'll, I'll wrap up uh, pretty soon. Um, this is a case, and this illustrates a different principle, which is sometimes you find unusual mutations in a known gene. So in this case, this was referred from David Sweetser, uh, uh, clinical geneticist at Mass General. It's a child with microanathia, mandibular distractions, and dys dysostosis. Actually, several mandibular surgeries were required. Um, there's also tracheo and... Uh, Bronchomalacia, you know, just tracheostomy. Um, the skull is abnormal, and there's visual impairment, severe, severe developmental delay. And interestingly, there is aortic aneurysm, dilatation of some of the other vessels, and there's a uh, hypoplasia of one of the carotid arteries. So there are vascular abnormalities as well. There was a uh, chromosomal microarray done that showed this small deletion that took out part of this gene, but this gene is known to be a, a predisposing factor for Jobert syndrome, which this child has no evidence of and would be just a carrier for, an asymptomatic carrier. So that didn't seem to be relevant. But whole exome sequencing revealed a candidate mutation in this gene fibrillin-1, which some of you may know is famous for causing Marfan syndrome. But this patient was not in any way thought to have Marfan syndrome, especially the craniofacial anomalies are somewhat different. Um, so uh, this variant falls at the an interesting position. So this is a canonical splice acceptor upstream of exon 64 in the fibrillin gene. And you'll notice here there's a heterozygous mutation at this particular position, a pyrimidine to a pure, uh, excuse me, yes, pyrimidine to a purine transversion at the minus five position. Now, most splicing mutations are right here in the AG dinucleotide that's almost invariant. But uh, we've had some experience in the past with the mutation at the minus three position that turned out to be functional. So we're very suspicious that this is actually uh, a mutation that disfavors the utilization of this exon. And just as we were entertaining that hypothesis, a literature review revealed that, in fact, there are mutations like that. And uh, they're reported in uh, a Marfan-like syndrome that has progeroid characteristics and this is a girl who's affected with an exon 64 skipping mutation. It's a different part, a different place, and it's at the other end of the exon. This is a boy who has the same thing. And there's a quite remarkable coincidence of some of the findings in these individuals with the proband here. So we suspect this is a remutation, as it were, of a gene that's been previously reported to cause this unusual syndrome. And we expect to find a fair number of those in these types of analysis. Not every syndrome that we think is novel will turn out to be novel once you uh, resolve it. All right, so um, one last case here. This is one of my favorites. It was one of the first cases. And it illustrates to me that, you know, any one case can lead you in a new and unexpected direction in science. You know, I think that's one of the points that, Francis Collins likes to make is when you do human genetics, you, you don't know what you're going to end up studying at the end when you find the gene. You, you just hope it's not immunology. So uh, anyway, in this case, this was a uh, condition called distal arthrocarposis type 5. There's 10 types. The gene was not known. 
uh, we sequenced a patient who was a de novo mutation and found a mutation in a gene called piezo, uh, which is actually quite well known now because of work from Artem Patapushin and his colleagues, beautiful work actually at the Scripps Institute. This is a mechanically sensitive ion channel with a large number of transmembrane domains. And it's unique in that unlike many ion channels that are voltage gated, this channel responds to pressure on the cell membrane by releasing an ion current, a cation current, um, and so-called mechanically activated current. And so the particular mutation in the proband that we found was a deletion of a single amino acid in the C-terminus. Another collaborator found a mutation over here and Artemis showed that these are gain-of-function mutations, which resolved the etiology. We had two independent cases. And then work by Mike Bamshed and his colleagues in Seattle went on to show that there's actually three different overlapping phenotypes that uh, correspond to mutations in this gene. So we got interested in piezo, and we decided just to look, as, as you do in developmental genetics, for where it was expressed. And the surprising thing is that we found that while it does express joy expression in the plasma membrane, meeting this known response to pressure. In fact, the most prominent site of expression is in the nuclear membrane. And so that's shown for you here. This is an antibody to piezo 2 We have actually seven different antibodies now, and they all give this pattern. Um, and so this is DAPI stain nucleus. This is not in the cell membrane. And when you knock it down, these are just a myoblast cell line called C2C12 cells. That's not important. You see this effect in vivo as well and in many different cell lines that are developmental at least. You get a striking decrease in cell proliferation. To make a long story short, the hypothesis is that in some way, piezo in the nuclear membrane is sensing forces that are transduced to it by the cytoskeleton and that in fact, there's some coordination of M phase uh, where these cells of rest that don't proliferate with pressure or tension on the cytoskeleton. So this is a direct hypothetical link between mechanotransduction via the cytoskeleton and the decision of a cell to divide. This could be really important, we think. So uh, there's a known paradigm for this, which is called the link complex, linker of nucleoskeleton and cytoskeleton, which in fact corresponds, there's a four component complex here, nesprin, which mediates forces from the cytoskeleton on the nuclear membrane. They go across the outer and inner nuclear membrane via these sun proteins to emerin and interact with the nuclear matrix. There's various ways you affect transcription in the peripheral heterochromatin from this signal. We think piezo may be a calcium signal that uh, corresponds to the signaling mechanism of this mechanism. So um, that's piezo. So I'll stop there. I'm going to... Uh, Acknowledge the many collaborators that we have. Uh, Falzon's work has been critical so far. Joan, Catherine, Pedro, and Ophir are uh, going to be great uh, additions to this, and uh, um, we're looking forward to that. Hazel works with Ophir. There are several postdoctoral fellows in Eric and my lab who are working on the functional investigations that I described to you. They have a terrific genome analysis group led by Shamil Sineev and Donna Guzman. Um, and then our administrative team over here. So um, probably the biggest challenge we're facing is, is getting the throughput up to so we can uh, actually deserve to call this a rapid uh, process. So far, we've been accumulating cases, uh, although they're coming quickly now. And so the goal will be to get the sequencing done as rapidly as possible and turn to the uh, disease modeling aspects. And so we hope to be able to functionally annotate the craniofacial disease gene uh, genome uh, from this type of approach. So I'll stop there. Um, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dick. Okay, do we have any questions? I'm just wondering um, how you might be using the phenotype data in your queries of, you know, matchmaker, or some of the other resources that um, you're obviously leveraging in your in your yeah that's that's a really good question Mosa. Um, well we've been able to use Matchmaker successfully. Um, the problem would be the imprecision with which clinicians describe craniofacial syndromes. So despite the wonderful ontogenies now, making their way into clinical practice hasn't yet happened that much, right? So 
that would be an important thing for us, I think, going forward. So a lot of these syndromes seem to be one-offs, but the most efficient way to solve them is to find another case, not to make a zebrafish model, even though with all due respect to Eric. Um, so um, we're using Matchmaker, and we've used it uh, successfully a couple of times, and we've had surprising uh, the good results by luck and coincidence, but it's not going to be sufficient to find the second hits that are out there. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Anybody else? Oh, here we go. Just one point in that I, um, we've done a fair amount of sequencing with the group in Pakistan um, and looking at the one family or patient, one off patient with no sieves who is consanguineous um, in a in a population where consanguineous mating is almost universal, um, it doesn't necessarily imply a recessive, particularly in a situation where you don't have a family to basically give you a pattern of inheritance that was more characteristic. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Rich. I guess the only thing I would say is I would I wasn't advocating sequencing consanguineous pedigrees where there weren't other sieves. All I was saying that we, we found we didn't have to sequence all the other sibs. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I don't know if you talked about this before, Dick, but what about mosaicism? Is there any chance of uh, mosaicism in some of these dysmorphologies? There certainly is. Um, you know, we heard this interesting case at the Gordon Conference uh, this year uh, of, of such a case. Um, you know, unless you detect it in peripheral blood or in a skin biopsy, though, you're not going to be able to detect it um, uh, at all, I think. And so we haven't encountered any such cases, and um, I think they would be modelable if you could. But um, I, I'm sure they exist, and I think they may be more, much more common than, than appreciated. That's, that's all I could tell you at this point. Okay, great. Thanks.